Anita Baxter Blau. I'm a lecturer in biology. James Shermer, uh, tenure track faculty in English. I'm Paul Byers right here, just a student. I'm Nair Sharif, I'm the director of Flint Rising. Uh, I'm Jason Kosnowski, I teach in political science. Lee Dillaham, a student in political science. Taylor Carter, student and member of student government. I'm Zendia, I'm a student. I'm Tabitha, in the community, her mother. <laughs> Pat Emignanu, lecturer in English and Africana Studies. Lecturer in Public Health and Health Science. I'm Crystal, I'm a student. Jeff, student. I'm Shelby Lane, I'm a wildlife bio student here. I'm Kaylee Raganese, and I'm a student. I'm Megan Joseph, and I'm a student. I'm Melissa Secor, and I'm a student. Emily Fewerherm, um, tenure track. I'm Benedict, I'm an ally. I'm Erica, I'm a faculty ally. I'm Tyler, I'm a student. David McEachran, music student. McKenna, um, I'm a biology student. I'm Marissa, I'm a bio student. I'm EJ, I'm a music student. I'm Rachel, I'm a music student. I'm, <laughs> um, I'm Alicia, I'm a bio student. I'm Michelle Silva, Department of Communication Studies lecturer. I'm Pam Anzik, a lecturer in nursing. Jennifer Miller, lecturer in biology and an alumni. Hello everyone, my name is India Haygood. I'm a Flint native, a Carmen Ainsworth graduate, and a freshman here at the University of Michigan Flint. I am majoring in now health science, but I was biology. Anywho, and I'm minoring <laughs> in healthcare administration while pursuing a pre-dental concentration. I can attribute much of my educational success so far to my mother, Tabitha Haygood, dual enrollment program in the EOI office. I'm working hard to earn my education to build a bright future for myself in becoming a dentist. I also serve as a senator for U of Flint Student Government and an active member of Black Student Union. I'm so happy to see so many of my fellow students here. Thank you for being here today. This semester, I'm taking four classes, pre-calc with John Moliasa, anatomy and physiology with Jennifer Miller, dance with Beth Freeman, and English with Scott Atkinson. When I think about my time at U of M Flint so far on this campus, from the things I've learned to the people who have inspired me, nearly all of it is related to my interaction with the Leo lecturers here. Leo lecturers play such a tremendous role in this campus, far more than most of our fellow students are even aware of. Every Leo lecturer I've come in contact with or have been taught by has played a tremendous role in molding me into who I, who I am today. Not to take away from any of the shared relationships that I've built with all my professors and that have taught me so much and that I look up to in so many ways, it's a tough call. But I would say the lecturer that I've been most impacted by so far is Nicole Yambrick in biology. Last year I was a student in dual enrollment in Bio 307 class, which is an anatomy class. I will let you all know a little secret. I wasn't doing too well in her class. <laughs> I had taken the class in Nicole the semester before and I had gotten an A. So clearly I thought that it was going to be pretty easy. I had taken the class with her. I thought it was going to be like pretty much the same, but it was not. It was a total different ballgame in terms of workload and difficulty. I wasn't really sure if I could do it or if I knew how. Then one day after class, she stopped me and said, you will not fail this class. Looked me straight in my eyes and told me to my soul, I'm not failing. <laughs> as smart as you are, I will not let it happen. It's, going to, it's not going to happen on my watch. And the next class, we set up times for extra tutoring. And before you knew it, we were at Starbucks once a week going over lecture notes. I started bringing some of my friends along and all of our grades improved and I ended up getting a B plus after all. Like many of you, I was shocked and furious when I learned that 20% of our Leo lecturers in Flint, like Cole, make less than $30,000 a year. 57% of them makes them less than $40,000 a year. Um, on, on the one hand, the administration here at the University of Michigan Flint tells an impressive story about how valuable a degree from the U of M Flint is. But on the other hand, they refuse to pay our Leo lecturers a living wage. This is the definition of hypocrisy. I have this to say to the President Schissel and the other members of the U of M administration. Stop telling me how much you think our education is worth. I don't want any more sale pitches about how my own future. Don't print any of more of those glossy pamphlets about the admi ad admissions office that no one reads. Please do not spend my tuition dollars yet on another marketing campaign. Instead, instead, show me. Show me how much my education is worth. Show me by paying our Leo lecturers salaries that match their skill, experience, passion, and working for young people like me. Show me how much my education is worth by making sure I have all the same resources and opportunities here in Flint that the students in Ann Arbor do. Our Leo lecturers here in Flint deserve a raise. It's time to respect the Lex. Let's keep fighting until we win a better contract for our Flint Leo lecturers. 
Thank you all. Let's go. Leo. Well, I, I apologize because I think there are a couple of people in the room that are going to hear what I've, have already heard what I've said, uh, but I think it's important for me to say it here too that yes, I am the chair of the English department, and the more I've been involved in the university and its relationships and seeing how um, just how much lecturers do, right? I mean, there, there is the teaching load, there are those ex sorts of expectations, but in terms of what um, lecturers allow, have allowed my department, have allowed me to do, in terms of managing the department, and being more involved in what's and seeing what goes on in the university, and just in terms of the, the support that lecturers provide to the university and all of the ways that they provide it, um, it's really opened my eyes to see just how much um, initially deserving people are of the, the kinds of things that the union is asking for, but just this is, things need to happen. Right? Things need to happen, that's about, that's about all I can say. And then I give my full support to the union, to lectures in the English department, and across UN Flint, here we're in Ann Arbor. Thank you. Thank you for <laughs> Under the wire, lots of things are happening very quickly. But um, we still aren't where we need to be yet. Um, again, to introduce myself, my name is Bill Emery. I am the Flint campus organizer for the Leo Lecturers Union. Um, so I represent or work on behalf of about 330 lecturers here in Flint. Um, there are seven, almost 1,700 lecturers across the three campuses. Um, so this is a relatively large conversation that we're having um, around the low wages here. The lecturers first formed a union back in 2005. And forming the union was a very big step. Um, some of the lecturers who are here in the room today were present around the time of the forming of the union. In Flint, before the union was formed, the minimum full-time salaries for lecturers on this campus in 2004 were $16,000 a year for full-time teaching, people with master's degrees and PhDs. Virtually every lecturer who taught on this campus prior to 2005 taught semester by semester and had no long-term job security or guarantee of work after that. Um, many Leo lecturers who taught on this campus had health insurance during the time they worked in the fall and in the winter semesters, but would have to participate in COBRA in order to maintain health insurance over the course of the summer. So needless to say, the desire for a union was pretty strong, and that's why a union was formed back in 2005. So we've come a long way for Leo over the course of four or five successive contracts in terms of making job security stronger, in terms of making sure that full-time lecturers have access to health insurance, uh, and in raising wages, um, even though the minimums have not moved a ton from $16,000 to $27,300 a year, um, that's almost a 100% increase over where they were in 2004. Um, so that's kind of the history of the union and why it's gotten, why it got started in the first place um, here. Um, where we're at now, the current contract, like I said, the minimum starting salaries for lecturers here is $27,300 a year currently. Um, and again, virtually all of the lecturers who teach on this campus, all 330, have a master's degree or a PhD. Um, many of them are published in their field. Many of them do service work above and beyond their teaching load, as Dr. Shermer may have alluded to. Um, lecturers do a ton on this campus and are not given much for it. In addition to that minimum number being so low at 27.3, the median, the middle, the median salary for a lecturer on this campus is below $38,000 a year. Um, so the University of Michigan Flint does not pay its lecturers fair wages, plain and simple. Um, it's also a question, if some of you were at the rally uh, back on March 23rd, of justice between the campuses too. Um, because our colleagues in Ann Arbor, the median salary there for lectures is about $50,000 a year, which is also too low. But why does the University of Michigan treat Flint and Dearborn so differently than Ann Arbor? I think that's a question that we need to continue to raise, not just for Leo and make sure that our Leo lecturers get paid, but also justice for our tenure track allies, some of whom are here today, justice for the staff members here on campus who um, have recently been sent out a notification that if they try to participate in our LEO activities, they will be reported to HR. So the university oh, is taking gosh. union busting tactics against staff here at this university. Okay. Um, and for the students. <laughs> uh, we need to be working for justice for the That's students here in Flint. Um, as Stephanie Halderloos, our Flint campus chair, shared during the march on March 23rd, um, the four-year graduation rate for University of Michigan Flint students is 
Four year graduation rate here is 14%. And this is because we have seen a systematic disinvestment in Flint, both as a community and as this specific campus by the University of Michigan system, by the state of Michigan, um, and, by, and by the donors who have contributed to the University of Michigan as well. So we gotta change that narrative. And I'm very proud to be part of this conversation where Leo is working to start to change that narrative. So let's talk about the Leo contract, because that's what we've got right in front of us right now to make sure that our Leo lecturers who, who live and work and teach here in the Flint community are paid a fair wage. 27th of last year. Um, at that time, we had set ground rules with the university. We were trying to reach a final agreement by April 3rd. That was what we mutually agreed to in our ground rules. On April, uh, October 27th, when we made that, when we started our bargaining, we made our initial salary demands. Our salary demands were not outrageous. We demanded that the minimum salaries for Flint lectures be raised to $56,000 a year. For people with a master's degree, with a PhD, working full time, that's not outrageous. Washtenaw Community College starts at $56,000 a year for its lecturers with master's degrees. With PhDs, they start at 72. Even Mott Community College starts at $40,000 a year. And don't get me wrong, I think Mott is an important institution and I'm really glad that it's serving the Flint community. But the University of Michigan has not even deigned to keep up with, Flint, with Mott Community College. We're supposed to be victors in the best and yet right here in the community, we're not even competitive in Flint. So, our demands were not unreasonable for Flint and for Dearborn, $56,000 a year. We made that offer on October 27th. It wasn't until February 12th that the University of Michigan's administrative team on the bargaining side even offered a response. And when they did, they did not come close to the 56. No, 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 no. What they offered is next year to raise the number from $27,300 a year to $28,300 a year. That was their initial response. Their response, their first offer at the bargaining table, far from seeking justice for our Leo lectures, would not have even kept up with inflation. <laughs> so we put essentially the same offer back on the table a few days later, and then they didn't respond again until March 23rd, the bargaining session right here in Flint. And no, 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 they didn't come close to 56 again that time. They said, okay, you're right, 28.3 was too low. What if next year we raised it to 29.3? He's not. <laughs> and we sent back pretty much the same offer and said, tell us when you're getting serious because this is ridiculous. So then they came back a little bit later and their offer is now currently as it stands to raise the minimums in Flint to $30,300 in year one and $34,000 a year by 2021. So this university is not getting serious about paying its educators a fair wage. Um, and I don't think, I'm preaching to the choir here when I say that underpaying the teachers who are teaching 58% of the undergraduate student classes here at the University of Michigan Flint is not just a disservice to those educators, but also a disservice to all of you as students who are here. And all of you as, as um, colleagues and faculty and staff who are here, who have overburdened, overworked um, people that are teaching your classes or working in your departments with you, people who need to maintain second and third jobs in order to keep their job down. There's a lecturer in the English department here who moonlights pouring concrete and makes more money pouring concrete than he does teaching here, even though he has a master's degree and has taught here for over 10 years. So that's the kind of situation we're in here. And this is what we're up against in this bargaining process. I do have some good news in that we have been able to successfully bargain a number of pieces that are not directly related to salary with the university. So for example, um, it used to be that you had to maintain a 50% teaching load every semester in order to maintain access to health insurance benefits. They've now changed that to you have to average 50% teaching load to have, have it over the course of a year in order to maintain access to health insurance benefits. So that's something real that we've won. Between 35 and 50 Flint lecturers next year will have full year health insurance that didn't have it before. So like that's, that's a win, right? That's not enough. Another big win that we've had. Previously, under the former contract, lecturers with disabilities who were seeking accommodations could only, their process was to contact their department chair directly about accommodating those disabilities. Well, the thing is, even when you have great department chairs, like we have one in the room here, even when you have great department chairs who are running the department, lecturers often feel as though by communicating their disability and their accommodations that they need for that, that they may not get another class next semester. So many lecturers with disabilities did not seek the accommodations that they deserved out of concern that they wouldn't get classes if the accommodations they sought were costly or burdensome. 
Now we have won an independent ombudsman on each campus that lecturers will go to first, determine the nature of the accommodations, and department chairs will be notified what's needed. And we think that that means that the, our lecturers with disabilities are going to feel a lot safer seeking accommodations. So that's a win. Lecturers in the, under the previous contract could never, never, ever obtain an open-ended appointment. Even people who had been teaching here, we have, we have lecturers who have been teaching here for 40 years, were still on only multi-year contracts. We have won in our contract negotiation process that after a major review in year four and another major review in year eight and a continuing review in year 12, that after 12 years, lecturers will be eligible for uh, open-ended appointments and professional development check-ins every seven years after that. Um, so you won't have people who have been teaching here for 27 years concerned about how their review is going to go next year and whether or not the university wants to keep them around, because that's crazy. So that's a win. We have open-ended appointments for long-term <laughs> Um We have been bargaining very, very hard to try and bring the university to a better place when it comes to the salary offers, right? Just to give you a, a sense of how busy we've been over the last few weeks, we bargained for a whole day on, on Friday, March 23rd here in Flint. We bargained for six hours on Wednesday, March 28th. We bargained all day again on Friday, March 30th. We bargained again on Tuesday night, April 2nd for several hours and Wednesday night, last night, for several hours. And they're bargaining right now <laughs> down in Ann Arbor. And they're going to be bargaining for a full day in Ann Arbor tomorrow. And we're going to be bargaining again on Saturday morning. And if it doesn't get resolved by then, we may end up having a, you know unscheduled bargaining session on Sunday as well. We are trying to do everything we can to avoid having to do the two-day walkout action that you've probably heard of at this point. But the university is just not moving the needle. And our lecturers, I think quite fairly and quite justly, have said that at some point enough is enough. We've been at this bargaining table for six months, and the farthest they've come is a couple thousand dollars, a salary that isn't even just. So um, we are working very hard to prevent this two-day walkout, and I want you to know that. I want you to know that when your people in the community are asking you questions, or your students, or your colleagues, people are like, what's going on? Know that we are doing everything we can to avoid this. Um, but if we have to go forward with it, we want to make sure we have um, your full support for that as well. Um, I think that's pretty comprehensive background and bargaining update. Lectures in the room have been involved. Am I missing any important details that I should get out there? OK. So then at this time, I would like to introduce Anita Baxter. Blau. 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 I'm sorry. So if you're here, you likely know why we're walking out potentially, hopefully not. But you probably don't know why we're doing it this particular way. Why a two-day walkout? Why are we doing it now? Why aren't we doing it after the contract? So our contract expires April 20th. After April 20th, we lose a significant amount of our potential bargaining power. Our only method of bargaining after our contract ends would be to refuse to give grades to the university and thus to students. And our union thought that pursuing a grade strike such as this uh, withholding our grades from the university would be needlessly disruptive to our students. So we decided not to do that. That was too much. So, uh, however, any work action that we would take after our contract expires would have to wait until fall semester begins. Because as per our bylaws, we're not allowed to bargain during the summer. So it would have to wait till fall. So, in order to lend urgency to our bargaining process while also reducing the impact on our students, our union leaders, they settled on this proposed two-day walkout instead of an indefinite strike as has been done in the past. So though it technically is a violation of our contract, our leaders felt that it was a measured, responsible, but effective method uh, with which to influence the course of our bargaining process. Our goal is to make the university administration listen to us and to take us seriously while disrupting our students as little as possible. So on this note, uh, we're not taking job action at classes that are off campus, such as the deep, the dual enrollment high school classes. We're not disrupting clinicals and hospital settings. And we also understand that there's some things that can't be rescheduled, particular clinicals on campus or lab exams, things like that. So those things are happening. The teachers, the lecturers who teach those classes will go and give those non-rescheduled exams and then come back out to the picket lines with us. Maybe they were there before, so they'll go back to the picket lines. 
So we're understanding the fact that there are some things that can't be rescheduled and we don't want to disrupt our students. So hopefully, as you can see, we care deeply about our students and we don't want them to be impacted by this. But we are at a point where we do need to say enough is enough. Lecturers with masters and PhDs, some who have been here for decades, shouldn't have to live on poverty level wages. That's unacceptable. So uh, we're hoping that we can pursue this job action in a way that is least impactful for our students, but we'll make our point to the university. So what will happen if we do the walkout? What will it look like? We'll have multiple active picket lines on all three campuses. And this will be on Monday, April 9th and Tuesday, April 10th, assuming we don't come to a reasonable contract before then. Sunday night, we'll announce the locations of the picket lines to fellow Lex and allies who've signed up to join us on the picket lines. You're welcome to do that. There are picket sign-up sheets in the back if you haven't. There's an online one as well. Our picket lines uh, can't be weak. We'll have dozens of lecturers here at U of M Flint picketing, uh, but in order to have our walkout be the most effective, we need help from our allies. We need students and tenure track faculty and community members to help us fill out our lines. So solidarity in the picket lines is the best way to help us have uh, the university listen and to have our needs met. So for the next part of our agenda, what we're going to do is we're going to break up everyone who's here into four groups. We're going to have groups of students, both grad and undergrad. We'll have them over in this side here. We're going to have tenure track faculty and staff in the middle. We'll have labor brothers and sisters and community allies, uh, parents, etc. And this third one over here. And uh, we're going to have the lecturers dispersed among the groups to help support everyone. And what we're going to do is we're going to come up with a uh, plan for ally action. So what can we do to encourage more allies to help join us uh, in our efforts here? So uh, afterwards, each group is going to share their ally action plan with the group. And so you'll want to pick a spokesperson uh, as well who will give your action plan to the group. So if we want to break up into the groups here, as I can do for the petition also, sharing that. We did notice there were a couple issues with like, the link that I had brought me to the petition, but then the event for the sign up wasn't clarified. So if oh. we can do a little tweaking on that to make sure that the website is clear okay. where you sign up, then we can share that. We discussed making an event so that we can share the event for the two days um, with the sign up sheet in the link for the description of the event so that we could have it all clear and right there in one place. It's going to be much easier for everybody to just click on, read, oh, click on this, sign up, easy, easy. Um, we discussed maybe pizza and t-shirts, draw people in, um, you know, free t-shirts, bring everybody in. Um, and then just share, uh, one person brought up sharing with like the email list on your classrooms. Um, just share it out to your classes and let them know what's going on and give them information maybe they're not aware of the situation. So sharing it through Blackboard, through your email list, through your classes as well, letting people know. Uh, we had talked about maybe flyers, Ann Arbor's doing flyers, but as it was brought up, you know, tomorrow's Friday, it's gonna happen Monday, Tuesday, flyers may not be that helpful at this point. So, um, so just clarifying the website, like when I went on and I did the petition and then I went to look for the sign up, I can, it wasn't readily okay. right there phone friendly. That was one of the things, one of the words that brought up was, it's not mobile friendly ah, um, to find it. So when I clicked an event link, it took me to one from February. And I was like, no, that's not going to help me out, yeah. you know? Fair enough. So okay. if we can just clarify and yeah. clear that up, just clean it up a little bit. Okay. And then we can do a lot of social media sharing, and that should help bring people to join. And um, even if they don't have to sign up, welcome to just come and walk and bundle up and just participate. Uh, and we did talk about the three locations where everybody's going to be and stuff like that so that we can have, if there's a smaller group, go to where the smaller group is to show bigger numbers in each spot. Cool. Just why they were here, which is really interesting. Yeah. yeah. And we got some really passionate responses and commitment to our cause. So I was very grateful to hear that. It was very nice. Our, uh, our conversation centered around a couple different things. One of the things that kind of an acknowledgement of the sort of last minute nature of the thing and what we're trying to do and what can we do with the certain amount of time we have allotted. There are some department meetings tomorrow. Um, the English department has a meeting tomorrow, so there's a discussion of 
some kind of a statement there. There's also a governing faculty meeting at noon tomorrow. Um, and so there was also discussion of at least just kind of an informational statement, like, hey, y'all, this thing is ha potentially happening next week. Uh, because it became apparent to the, in the conversation that we had that there are still a number of tenured or tenure track faculty who don't actually know what might be happening next week. Um, and that was kind of, I think that was surprising to all of us because we think we have better communic lines of communication. Uh, so, but there was also discussion of um, developing some kind of a fact sheet because there have been some face-to-face -face conversations about the different accommodations that faculty have been making either in terms of their, uh, their own standing or students in terms of their comfort level when it comes to crossing a picket line. And so developing some kind of a fact sheet that would just share options or here's what other faculty have done or things that they've, they, that they've considered. And uh, there was also some discussion about uh, kind of, a, again, last minute developing non-university email addresses and kind of trying to circulate those that way to get some additional lines of communication happening. I think that was, yeah. was good. There was the flyers one too. That oh, and the flyers thing yeah. too. Who's? Uh, we were thinking, you know, because we don't want to send out something over U of M Flint email saying, you know, because you know I'm canceling class, and I guess you're not supposed to do that. Um, so, uh, <laughs> but you know, a lot of tenure track faculty don't know. There are a lot of people without tenure who are worried. So, what we thought was to have some sort of fact sheet with ideas for what to do with your class. Have someone on the picket line, you know, with a sign saying, "If you're a tenure track faculty, come talk to me," and then hand this out for people who didn't know and who, furthermore, don't understand, you know, what the implications are with ideas. You know, so you, you know, for example, maybe you could have your class online today, or maybe you could have them come out on a field trip. That's what I'm telling my students, right? <laughs> That's what I class, right? Field trip. You know, go to picket line. So you have to have some sort of thing, because it's not, you can't send it out over to everyone. Right. But you know, if you get people on the way in, for people who are sympathetic or confused, and so what we're going to do is we're going to develop, you know, we're going to, us, we're going to develop some sort of, um, some sort of flyer, and maybe if then if we could send it to you to print out for Monday and Tuesday, and then we can have, you know, one of the tenured people who are there, be the hey, talk to me if you're tenured and you're interested, and then be the I one to hand it. Turning around something quick enough that it could be ready to distribute at the governing faculty meeting tomorrow noon. Mm -hmm. That felt like having. I don't know. I mean, be a, a good I'll thing. be there. Um, um, so I, I'd be yeah. happy to try and turn something around tonight. Yeah. So if you, could, I mean, if you, I that have would, some materials already. That um, would be because, like, yeah. the 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 deans, or at least our dean in CIS, has been cagey yeah. about what. Is gonna like you're not really supposed to do it. You get fired, but you know. We've got half of the lectures in CIS signed up for picking chips already. Though. So it's like, <laughs> I mean, nothing's gonna nothing, in, in, in CIS probably nothing's gonna happen, but you know. Yeah. No, it's, I just it's a it, you know it doesn't help that the university communicated to staff that they're gonna be reported to HR if they participate yeah. on the web. They are trying to create a little bit. Of Isn't that an unfair labor practice? They're at well, they, they don't have a the, union. How, who's going to fight for them? You know, like it's going to be us, and we're a little busy right now. So, but they're, I mean, it's definitely they can wear buttons. Yeah. Okay, well, okay. Well, we so, can talk about the intricacies of I mean, national labor relations. Summer to help uh, fix that problem for the staff okay. and uh, for students. Um, some students, uh, it's a whole range of things. Students who uh, there are some programs where requisite classes are only offered once every two years, so students are here longer because they don't aren't able to take courses. At a, a time that they want. Um, students want to be able to benefit from transfer priority to Ann Arbor. Um, uh, the restoration of programs like the Challenge Program that assisted students who were maybe not prepared yet for uh, the college setting and helped them get there. Um, the fact that the Mental Health Services Clinic on campus only has three full-time counselors, and I think actually some of them are not full-time. Um, and uh, like the low wages for student workers, there's a whole range of issues okay. that they started talking about. and. Uh, I am excited to support that group in, in moving forward. Um, I, I, I have some, I don't have much extra time, but I've got a few hours that I can help to facilitate. And I think any of the students that are interested in engaging in that conversation moving forward, let me know. I'll make sure that you're included on the communications for that. Um, they're probably going to meet next Thursday from 6.30 till 8. 
um, on campus here, Thursday the 12th, right? Is that the day? Yeah. Um, I don't have a location yet for that, but that's the time that they're looking at. And they're also looking at perhaps um, meeting again on Thursday the 19th, jointly in the car on the way to see Toronto Burke speak at MSU. Um, <laughs> So yeah, that group is, is moving as well, which is really exciting. So thanks for asking about that, yeah. Mm -hmm.